Good morning and welcome to our webinar on making your 2021 crop insurance decisions. I'm Jim Mintert, a professor and director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture here at Purdue University. Joining me today is my colleague, Dr. Michael Langemeyer, who's also a professor of ag economics and associate director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture. And of course, we're talking about crop insurance today because the crop insurance computations all require prices from the month of February. And so this is the first day we actually have those prices available to us. And then secondly, of course, those crop insurance decisions need to be made by the middle of March. So we've only got about two weeks to make those choices. So we're going to walk through some of the changes that we've seen relative to last year and maybe provide a little bit of guidance with respect to your decision making process. And you know, Michael, as you look at it, uh, you know, one of the things that's really kind of interesting is how much things have changed this year versus last year with respect to returns to land, revenue projections, uh, even potentially cash rental rates. So Michael, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, certainly 2020 crop year was a very good year uh, from, a, from a net return to, to land per acre basis, but also 2021. Uh, looks like it's going to be a pretty good year. That increases the importance of developing a marketing plan and thinking about your crop insurance decisions. There's quite a bit to lose. And so the, this, this consideration related to downside risk becomes uh, increasingly important uh, because we have quite a bit of revenue we want to try to protect. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things, I think, looking at some of your computations for the case farm that you manage here or, or, or simulate here in West Central Indiana, is that if you look at net returns to land in 2020, that's the first time since um, 2013 when net returns to land have equaled or exceeded cash rental rates, right? And you're projecting yes. the same thing or at least something pretty similar for 2021. Yes, with the current with the current future prices. Yeah, so it's it's a markedly different situation that we've seen in recent years. And I guess the related point, and we should probably just make this right up front here at the outset is given that the revenues are so much higher this year uh, in terms of projected revenues than what they were a year ago this time, that means that those crop insurance premiums are gonna be substantially higher this year, right? So there's really two fa factors driving those premiums up. One is the dollars of revenue that you're covering. And as the dollars of coverage goes up, those premiums go up. The second factor is volatility. Prices this year in February were more volatile than they were in February a year ago. So those two factors are driving premiums up. So there's probably going to be a little bit of sticker shock when you look at those premiums for the 2021 crop year versus 2020. Keep in mind what's happening. Higher coverage, higher dollars of coverage you're buying. And then secondly, the volatility went up, right? Yeah, that's definitely the case. I mean, both of those, a higher projected price and, and higher volatility are, are leading to substantially higher premiums in some cases, particularly as you get to the higher coverage levels. Uh, but it just increases the importance of, of trying to mitigate downside risk because you have quite a bit to lose. Uh, those bushels are worth more uh, in the fall uh, than they were in previous years because of that higher projected price. Uh, one of the things we do uh, every year is, is talk about uh, different, different units that you can purchase. I'll start with the bottom one, enterprise units. This is addition of all units uh, in one county for a single crop. And so if you put all your corn together uh, for, a, for a county uh, and insure the corn in that county, uh, that would be an enterprise unit. If you, something, you want something a little bit smaller than that, or you want to insure uh, separate farms, for example, then you have to go to either basic units or optional units. Basic units are, are, have been around for quite some time. Uh, this is all of one crop in a county for a specific share of production. And so all owned in cash rent land for corn, for example, uh, is a basic unit for uh, an individual county. Uh, each share rent landowner arrangement uh, could also be a basic unit. And so uh, you could have several basic units uh, in the county. And, and, and so you're ensuring uh, the, the, the basic units or each individual farm, if you will, uh, compared to the enterprise unit. Uh, the optional unit breaks it down even further. Uh, each farm and crop is is insured separately, and so and so obviously you're busting up your own and cash rent land into multiple units uh, with the optional units. And as you'd expect, as you go from uh, uh, optional to basic to enterprise, the premium goes down. Uh, in other words, the uh, the the premium is quite a bit lower for the enterprise unit because you're not you're you're insuring all of the corn uh, in aggregate, and there's less chance of you actually getting a premium because of that aggregation. 
but also because uh, the enterprise units are more heavily subsidized. Uh, the subsidy for the enterprise unit uh, product is, is, is 80%, whereas the subsidy for basic units and optional units is, is much lower than that. Yeah, and so to reiterate, I guess, or maybe draw a conclusion there, Michael, we pretty strongly recommend people consider doing the enterprise units uh, over a period of years. It's highly likely that that's going to be beneficial to you. Um, I realize, you know, there's a little bit of a rub here because sometimes people like to think about the basic units and even the optional units because over time they're more likely to trigger a payment, but you're paying so much more for the product that over time you're typically better off with the enterprise units. There's some exceptions to that, right? I mean, if you think about some individual situations, but as kind of a general recommendation, I like to start people off by thinking about enterprise units and then ask yourself, is there a special reason why I need to be in one of these other two products? And there's gonna be some situations where the answer to that is yes, but um, for most of the people that we're talking to here in the Eastern Corn Belt, for example, and really throughout the Corn Belt, the enterprise unit is probably going to be the way to go because of that reduction in, in cost uh, and really a pretty substantial reduction, right? Yes. And a, and a couple more points there. There is some situations where the variability among farms is really substantial. Uh, and so certainly in those situations, you may want to look at optional or basic units rather than enterprise units. But you also have to think about what am I trying to do with my crop insurance product? If your goal is to try to mitigate downside risk, and really not to have a train wreck in years like 2012, when the yield is quite a bit lower, that enterprise unit uh, achieves that goal. Uh, it, it protects you, uh, it protects you uh, in, the, in those years where, where the yield for the uh, countywide and in the whole region uh, is, is really low. Yeah, you know, as I think about, for example, here in the Eastern Corn Belt, uh, Michael, when, when the basic units or even the optional units might fit as opposed to enterprise, it's probably a situation where a farm has a significant amount of acreage that's in upland areas and maybe has some farms in bottomland that, that has a possibility of flooding. And so that's one situation where maybe the enterprise unit might not fit quite so well. And that'd be a situation where you'd want to at least evaluate uh, one of the other two products. But for a more typical situation where that's not the case, where you don't have that big differential, um, we strongly consider, strongly recommend that you consider the enterprise units. Talk about the yield policies for us a little bit, Michael. The yield policies are not as commonly uh, uh, purchased as the revenue pr uh, products, which we're going to discuss next. But nevertheless, there is some farms in, in Indiana and across the Corn Belt that do use the yield uh, the yield products. We have area yield protection, which ensures against countywide production loss. It's based on county yields, of course. Uh, and so your policy protection, dollar amount of protection per acre times net acres. Uh, you can choose from 70 to 90 percent coverage level. If you're going to use the yield policy uh, area product, you're probably going to look at the 90 percent uh, coverage level for a countywide product. Uh, the yield protection product, the only difference here, a very important difference, is we use farm yields rather than county yields and we can give coverage from 50 to 85 percent. Uh, again, if you're going to use the uh, the yield protection product, you're going to you're going to want to choose the higher coverage level. Uh, yield protection is much cheaper than revenue protection, so certainly uh, if you're going to use the yield products, go with the highest coverage level that's available uh, in your county. Yeah, and just just to reiterate, if you are thinking about the area yield product, uh, the area yield protection product you absolutely need to look at the highest coverage levels. Uh, and it, it's expensive, but the probability of ever generating a payment at the lower levels if, because it's a county-based product is very low. So let's talk about the revenue policies, Michael, because most of our viewers and listeners are really focused on the revenue policies. Let's walk through some details and then we're gonna look at some examples. Yeah, there's certainly some farms in Indiana and, and, other, and other places in the Corn Belt that use the area revenue protection product. It ensures against countywide revenue loss, so it's based on county revenue. Uh, so it's county yield times coverage level times the greater of uh, projected price or harvest price. And so if the harvest price is higher, uh, you have more protection, uh, more protection than you had uh, at the beginning of the year using the projected price. And so, uh, and, and so that's a very important uh, point we need to make. It's greater of projected price or harvest price. Coverage level 70 to 90%. Uh, just like Jim indicated for the for the area yield protection product, uh, I would I would if you're going to use the area revenue protection product, go with the 90% coverage level. Uh, go with a high coverage level. 
Uh, and and th this is an option, something to look at uh, and compare to the revenue protection product, which is more uh, farm yield based. Yeah, good point. Looking at the revenue protection, it ensures against revenue loss due to, uh, due to a price change, uh, low yield or a combination of these two. Uh, it's calculated by using your approved yield or your, your RMA yield times the coverage level times the greater of projected price or harvest price. And so think about the revenue guarantee that you're currently looking at with the projected price we're gonna show you on, on the next slide as being your minimum guarantee. That guarantee will go up if the harvest price is higher than the projected price. And so, and, and there's, there's a couple of reasons why this revenue protection product is more appealing uh, to producers than the yield protection product. One of those is it does have that uh, it does have that uh, uh, clause in there that we can also have a revenue loss during uh, due to a price change. The other reason that we don't always think about, but is ext is extremely important. Let's say that the price goes up substantially from the projected price of the harvest price. In other words, uh, the February futures price compared to the October futures price. The October futures price is substantially higher. The revenue protection uh, policy a protection product is going to increase that revenue guarantee. And so you're, you're, you are ensuring those higher valued bushels with this product, whereas the yield protection product, you don't have that feature. It's, it's you use the projected price uh, to come up with the, to come up with the, 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 uh, the revenue guarantee for the yield protection product. And so, and so for those two reasons, this is the real workhorse uh, across the corn belt, this revenue protection product. Uh, the coverage levels do vary across the corn belt quite a bit. Uh, for Indiana, uh, if you take the northern half, northern two thirds, uh, it, it, the 85 percent coverage level uh, is very, very common for both corn and soybeans. As you get further south, uh, the crop insurance indemnity payments uh, tend to be a, 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 the, the crop insurance indemnity premiums tend to be a little higher for that 85 uh, percent uh, coverage level for the revenue protection. So as we get in that southern third, southern half of the state. Uh, there's quite a few people look at the 80% coverage level. And you know, Michael, that same scenario would apply over in Illinois. If you think about the northern roughly two-thirds of Illinois versus the th southern third, same kind of scenario plays out. So depending a little bit on where you're at, you're probably going to choose slightly different coverage levels. But the tendency has been to move to the higher coverage levels over the last several years. The other point to make, I think, is there was a change a few years ago with respect to how that policy is is. Uh, structured, it used to be that you had to choose the harvest price option so that you could benefit if prices increased over the course of the crop year and, and the fall price was higher than the February price. They changed the product in recent years. And so now that's the default choice. And you would only not have that if you opted out. So the vast majority of people do have that harvest price protection option in, embedded in their policy, which has been a, a nice move for a lot of people. And, and to save premium, do not we do not recommend that you that you purchase the harvest price exclusion product. That that uh, that that revenue protection product, when it says uh, the greater a projected price versus harvest price, is extremely powerful. If that harvest price increases you get a higher uh, a higher revenue guarantee. And so you're protecting those more expensive bushels. And so uh, the revenue protection product is definitely the, the choice if you're looking at revenue protection, revenue protection with harvest price exclusion. Uh, the, the projected price increased rather substantially uh, for both corn and particularly for soybeans. That's one of the reasons why the premiums are higher. Again, as in, uh, Jim indicated earlier, the other reason is increased volatility. Utility. So that combination created some, some higher premiums, particularly for the higher uh, coverage levels. Uh, looking at the harvest price calculations, these, are, these will be based on settlement prices for futures contracts during October. Of course, the November futures for soybeans and the December uh, futures, futures for corn. Uh, even though the premiums are higher, we do not recommend that you reduce coverage this year to try to save on premium costs. I think there's enough downside risk this year that you still want that protection that you get uh, at, with the coverage levels you've been using in the past. Yeah, good point. And just to make that a little more concrete, I mean, those price changes are pretty substantial. So the February price for corn, for Dease corn came in at 458. So that's gonna be the projected price used on the 2021 crop insurance uh, contracts for corn. 
That compares to 388 last year. So that's a move of, uh, what, 58 plus 12, uh, 70 cents higher this year versus last year. On the soybean side, 1185 was the average for November soybeans during the month of February. That compares to 917 last year. Big jump. And that's pushed those premiums up because the dollars of coverage you're buying has gone up as well. You took a look at projected versus harvest uh, harvest corn prices over the years. And you know, Michael, when I looked at uh, the chart that you generated, it was really interesting to me. It jumped out when this was really beneficial. And I guess the thing I noticed was when that harvest price in the past has been higher than the projected price, the differential has been significant. It doesn't happen all that often, but when it does, it's a big, big difference, right? And this increases your revenue guarantee but more importantly, in 2012, if you remember what happened, uh, we, and we have it on this chart, uh, the harvest price was substantially higher than the projected price. We kind of had that natural hedge going on. And so if people that use this, the harvest price exclusion that we're, and we're using the projected price, uh, we're left with a very, very small indemnity payment. Their yield was down, but the actual price used to calculate uh, actual revenue <laughs> was relatively high because of that high uh, high corn price and high soybean price that you didn't you really didn't get much of a crop insurance indemnity payment in a year where you really thought you needed to have a good crop insurance indemnity payment. And so it just drives home the point that this revenue protection product where you have this where you have the higher of the projected price of the harvest price is extremely important. Uh, you know, extremely important. Uh, and and this, this chart shows you, I, I think, that that revenue protection product uh, is far superior uh, to that revenue protection product with harvest price exclusion. So you took a look a little uh, closer at your case farm for West Central Indiana, which is based actually on a farm, uh, a stylized farm for White County, Indiana. And you looked at the guarantees for 85% coverage. Yeah, the guarantees this year, and we'll show this in a little more detail in the next on, on, on the next uh, uh, slide, or, or, or we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second, but the revenue guarantees in, in 2021 are approximately $700. Uh, they're a good 75 to, 75 to $80 higher than what they were in 2020. Uh, and really pretty much from 2015 to 2020, they were, they were quite a bit lower. Uh, and so we're looking at some higher revenue guarantees this year. Uh, this is the highest revenue guarantee we've seen since 2013. So right at about $700 with that 80, 85% coverage level uh, in White County. Um, looking at that in a little more detail, the 75% the revenue protection product uh, has a revenue guarantee of about $625 uh, or very similar to the revenue guarantee for the 85% coverage level in 2020. So obviously we've getting stronger revenue guarantees uh, this year. Uh, as we go up to 80% revenue protection, uh, the revenue guarantee goes up to 660, uh, and the 85%, as I indicated, uh, has a revenue guarantee of, of $700 uh, per acre. Uh, that's still about $100 below total total cost. We include all cash and opportunity costs, but it's certainly much much higher uh, than what we've seen in recent years. And so, yes, your premiums are higher, but you are getting a higher revenue guarantee. Or, or more protection against downside risk. Yeah, an easy way to think of that, Michael, is those crop revenue guarantees are uh, up on corn anyway, up about 15% compared to where they were last year. That's a huge jump in one year's time. And they're even, the percentage is even larger for soybeans. The percentage for soybeans is more like 25% because of the large difference between projected price from 2020 to 2021. So well, let's talk a little bit about. about the Supplemental coverage, yeah. Yeah, a couple of words about supplementary coverage. Uh, this has been available for a few years, but it, it, it's, it's, it's coming to people's mind a little bit more this year uh, for some reasons that will become evident as we discuss this product. Uh, the SCO provides coverage from 86% down to the coverage level of an underlying revenue protection or yield protection policy. And so let's say you had 80% revenue protection product in, in Southern Indiana or Southern Illinois, uh, this would provide coverage from 86% down to that 80% level. Um, it can only be purchased. One of the things that's very, very important to keep in mind with the SCO, it can only be purchased if you enrolled in PLC. Uh, and, and so that's a very important feature of this product. 
Uh, mo a lot of people across the Corn Belt, I would say over half or, or most people are gonna, probably going to choose PLC for corn. And so this is something you can look at for corn. Uh, the, you may not uh, be choosing PLC for soybeans. And so let's, let's talk primarily about corn here. But the important, one of the important things to keep in mind here is this is a count, this is based on county yields. And so going back to the example I had, if you had an 80% revenue protection uh, a product, uh, that 80% would be uh, based on, on uh, farm yields, your individual farm yields, if you did enterprise units, the farm yields for the county, uh, that 86% down to 80% or 6% would be based on county yields. And so you're mixing farm and county yields. Uh, that bothers some people. Uh, we have a, we have something on the bottom of this slide here that gives an example of the of the coverage. Uh, if, if you had 85% revenue protection, expected county yield of uh, of $829 with the 458 projected uh, price and trade adjusted yield, and so the the maximum identity payment would be $8.29 uh, for that combination. You're only have an additional 1% of insurance there. That doesn't seem like very much, uh, but this only costs you about a dollar. Uh, you know, going from uh, you know 86% uh, SCO with an 85% revenue protection. So one thing, though, I think we need to make a point of here, Michael, is the idea that I think some people might have of perhaps if they've been previously at 85% coverage, they might think, well, I could drop my coverage back to 80% and buy the SCO product, which would give me coverage up to 86%. The problem with that is you're really not buying that kind of coverage. Um, because you're buying that 6% from 80 to 86 is on the county yield, it doesn't match up all that well necessarily with farm level coverage. And so I guess as a blanket recommendation, we would probably discourage people from reducing coverage from say 85% down to 80 and then using SCO as the add-on to get to 86% because you're not guaranteeing 86% of farm revenue. And that's that's the rub. And when you get to these county level products, 86% coverage isn't very high. Stated another way, it takes a, a substantial combination of, of either reduction in yield or reduction in price to drop that combination below 86%. So you're not, you're not getting the kind of coverage that you might think. And so if you've been buying 85% RP and you've been reasonably happy with it, uh, you might not want to think about doing, uh, reducing your coverage to 80 and adding SCO as a, as a supplement or as a replacement. It's, it's not the same thing. I guess that's really the point I'm trying to make, Michael. Just to, just to go further on that point, uh, I've done some calculations looking at why county using county yields. Uh, in the last 10 years, you would have got a, uh, a payment with a with a uh, 86% uh, in 2015, very wet June that year. So yields are relatively low in 2012, uh, but it's not very common. You could go back 20 years and there might be one additional year uh, where you would have got a payment. And so as, as you indicate, Jim, it's, it's just not the same as having an 85% revenue protection product, that 80% revenue protection and 6% uh, uh, SCO. So there's a new kid on the block this year, Michael. It's called Enhanced Coverage Option. And I know there's some people that maybe have heard about this but are uncertain as to how it works. Why don't you walk us through that? Yeah, this is an intriguing product. And I think it's going to fit uh, it fit in, in, in some, some farms' portfolio of, of products. And so let's talk a little bit about that. And maybe, maybe we'll talk a little bit about where this might fit. Well, first of all, with this Enhanced Coverage Option, uh, you have a choice between a 90% in a 95% coverage level. Um, and, and essentially what you're doing is let's look, let's look at the 95% coverage level. You're providing additional insurance from 95% down to 86%, down to where that SCO would kick in. So it, I think of this as an additional insurance over what you're, what's being provided with your revenue protection product. You have to purchase an individual insurance plan, RP or YP, to be eligible for ECO. Uh, and so you, you take your 90 or 95% and that extends down to 86%. So additional, additional coverage uh, 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 added to your revenue protection or yield protection product. Uh, like SCO, however, it is based on county yields. And so this ECO additional coverage, if you will, is based on county yields rather than farm yields. And so that makes it relatively difficult to analyze. Uh, you can purchase 
uh, ECO uh, and, and, and not SCO or vice versa. And so if you buy 90% or 95% ECO, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, uh, purchase the, the SCO. Uh, the cover, it's from the coverage level down to 86%. Uh, let's look at an example. Uh, if we had 85% revenue protection uh, and we chose 95% enhanced coverage option, the expected county revenue of $829, and so that was the harvest price trans, trend adjusted yield, the maximum indemnity, indemnity payment in that case would be approximately $75 or 9% of that county revenue of $829. So another way to think of, think about this, in addition to my in addition to my uh, uh, revenue guarantee, my revenue protection product, I've got an additional uh, $75 of, of county uh, county revenue uh, uh, guarantee uh, with the 95% enhanced coverage option product. So, Michael, it's it's an interesting product. It's new this year. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, you and I discussed previously before the program started was the fact that there were some private products that maybe mimicked this in recent years, and some people were purchasing those. They weren't widely used, but they were purchased in some instances. So one of the differences is since this is a product uh, emanating from RMA, there is a subsidy built into this. Uh, I think the subsidy on ECO is around 44%. 44%. Um, so, you know, that's lower than some of the other products, but if you compare it to the private products that were available previously, it's obviously a, a larger subsidy level. So it's interesting from that standpoint. The other thing about ECO that's, that's sort of interesting is the idea that, you know, anytime you buy a, a revenue policy, since it has a commodity price embedded in it, uh, in this case, I think in the, in the case of, uh, um, you know, we, we just pointed out that the prices are up about what, 15% uh, on corn. And I think you said 25% on, on soybeans. Those are, those prices are embedded in the, in the policy. So you could think of those prices as uh, your crop insurance policy as having a put option embedded within it. And so I've heard some people maybe make some comparisons to, for example, buying puts uh, on the futures on November futures for in the case of soybeans and on these corn futures in the case of corn relative to purchasing these insurance products. And that's a legitimate strategy. However, you want to think about the fact that what you're buying there is not exactly the same thing. Um, in the case of buying a put on the exchange, you're buying a pure price insurance policy. When you do it in the insurance product, you're doing it based on the revenue. And so just to think of a real simple example, there could be a situation where prices decline significantly, but the reason prices went down is because yields went up and the increase in yields would partially offset the value of that put. So it's, it's a complicated product. And I think you and I have concluded we probably need to do a little more analysis on it to uh, maybe a lot more analysis to decide where it fits and where it doesn't. But it is an interesting product and it does give us an opportunity to purchase some higher levels of coverage. And there's going to be some situations where that, that might be advantageous, right? Yeah, another situation where I think it might fit. Uh, let's say you have a farm that has some really tight working capital, really tight liquidity. That current ratio is well below two and they just can't afford very much downside risk. Uh, even though this is rather expensive, uh, this endorsement, it does help mitigate downside risk. And so if you're in a situation where uh, you, you just can't withstand a, a very large loss uh, in the fall, uh, this might be attractive uh, to those producers because it, it does provide uh, more protection on the downside than your typical revenue protection product for a cost. Uh, and that's what we're gonna talk about next uh, I'm going to use this case form again to talk about some possible premiums uh, for the different products. Uh, I, I did I did I did this work last Friday, and so I've got a slightly different projected price in the final. I'm using a 457 projected price and volatility of 0.23. Uh, the projected price is 458, and volatility might be a little different than what I've assumed in this work, but it it it, it really gets I think it's fairly close uh, what it's going to be in, in the final uh, in the final. Uh, uh, in the final analysis. Uh, and so I wanted to compare several different products here uh, for White County. And we'll start with corn and then we'll go to soybeans. Uh, if you look at the revenue protection product, 80% coverage, 
uh, you're looking at a estimated pre premium of about $13.50, pretty reasonable. If you do an 85% revenue protection, uh, that premium goes up to $25.50 approximately, so about a $12 increase. What do you get for that $12 increase? You get an increase in farm level revenue guarantee from approximately $660 to $700. And so a pretty large increase in revenue guarantee for that $12. And as I indicated, most people in, in, uh, in Northern Indiana pick the revenue protection 85% uh, coverage level. If we go with the 90, if the 85% revenue protection and 90% ECO, we have an additional premium of approximately $10. And so rather than $25 and 50 cents, uh, we have a, a premium that includes both revenue protection, 85% and the 90% ECO endorsement of about $35 and 50 cents or $10 increase uh, in, in premium. What do you get for that? You get an additional a county revenue guarantee of $33, but the key word there is uh, you get an additional county revenue guarantee, not an additional farm uh, level guarantee. And so if, 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 if farm yields are not identical to county yields, you're mixing coverage between the farm, uh, farm yields and county yields, and that could be problematic, which we'll talk, we'll talk about here in, in a little bit. Uh, if you go to the 95% uh, endorsement product, uh, compare that to the 85% revenue protection product. Uh, the premiums are substantially higher. So a $25.50 premium for the 85% RP product and a premium uh, of $52.50 for the, uh, the, the RP 85% and 95% ECO. So about a $27 uh, uh, increase in premium uh, going to that 95%. Uh, what do you what do you get for that? You get an additional county revenue guarantee of, of seventy four dollars added to uh, the, the seven hundred three dollar uh, revenue guarantee for the the eighty five percent revenue protection product. And so and so you you do get some higher guarantees uh, at the county level for that ninety percent ninety five percent, but it's certainly not a no brainer on whether that's worth it on an individual form. This is something individual forms need to carefully look at. Uh, and see if this additional uh, county revenue guarantee is worth uh, the additional premium. Yeah, so if you think about it, Michael, um, you know, envision a situation where in an enterprise unit farm, um, yields are essentially highly correlated, you know, almost perfectly correlated with uh, county yields. So then in that case, the additional revenue guarantee that you're picking up would match pretty closely, at least at your expected uh, revenue guarantee would match up pretty closely with reality. So then the, you, the way you, you might look at that is to say, well, you know, how much coverage am I getting for each a dollar, uh, additional dollar invested in the premiums? And so in the example that you had, um, if you take the straight 85% at $25, you're basically doubling your premium. You're going up about roughly $26 and you're picking up $74 in coverage, right? So you're getting $3 in coverage for every additional dollar in premium is, is one way to think about it. And I guess you have to kind of make up your own mind as to whether or not that's a that's a good ratio for you, but that's one way to think about it. What, how, much, how much additional premium am I paying to get that additional coverage? And one way to think about it is to look at it on a per unit basis and saying, well, it's in, in the example that you just did, it's not quite, but almost $3, right? So. And someone might be asking, why is there such an increase in premium as we go from 85% to 90% to 95%? Think about that. Uh, if, you, if you think about your revenue on your farm, there's several years that you can think of in the last 10 to 20 years where your revenue has, has, has dropped more than 10% uh, you know, from the spring to the fall uh, or 5% in the case of 95%. Uh, Gary Schnitke over in Illinois did some uh, did some analysis for for Illinois, and well over half the time, this 95% product would 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 create an indemnity payment, and so that's why it's so expensive. Is you're going to have frequent indemnity payments with that product. But remember what we're trying to do with that product. We're trying. This is this fits the situation uh, a farm a, a farm that had, that really can't afford much downside risk. You're paying for that protection. Uh, but you really are getting that protection, and particularly in the case that Jim talked about, where the county yield is highly correlated with the farm yield. Now we want to talk about some scenarios where these different products might pay out. And so 
the, the first scenario we're going to look at is a projected price uh, you know, of, of corn for the 457 or, or 458. And then we're going to assume that the harvest price declined uh, down to $4. So that's a 12.5% drop in price for the projected price of the harvest price. We assume that the yield did not change. We're right at trend yields for both the farm and the county. Well, obviously, because it's it's 12 and a half percent, the revenue protection 85 percent product uh, does not. There's not a, a payment that's triggered. We don't even trigger a payment with the 85 percent in SCO. Uh, however, in this case, we do trigger an indemnity payment with the uh, with the 90 uh, percent product or the 95 percent product. With the 95 percent product under this scenario, a drop in 12 and a half percent of price, no change in yield. The indemnity payment would be $62 per acre. And so that's a situation where a classic situation there uh, where, where it would trigger uh, the ECO 90%, ECO 95%. Now, a second scenario, let's assume that the price did not change from the projected to the harvest. So a, 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 the same projected price and harvest price, unlikely scenario, but let's just assume that occurred. In this case, we had, the county yields was the same. Uh, so we, we, we hit the trend on county, but for some reason, our farm yield in this county was substantially lower than the county yield. Uh, in this case, I'm assuming it was 150 bushel. Well, because the county yield did not change, that does not trigger a payment uh, for ECO 90% or ECO 95%. So even though our farm had lower yields, because the county yields were not lower, there's no ECO payments triggered. Of course, we would get a payment uh, under the revenue protection. In this case, would be approximately twenty dollars. Now we're going to look at a 2012 scenario, not quite as extreme as 2012, where the harvest price was higher, and both the farm and the county yields were lower. And so, in this case, we're going to assume a 150 bushel yield with a trend yield of approximately 180. In this case, uh, we would trigger both uh, revenue protection uh, uh, premium, approximately twenty dollars. And we would also also trigger uh, ECO and ECO 95% payments. And in fact, we would trigger payments at their maximum uh, in the, in this scenario because that that 150 versus 180 is a pretty big drop uh, in revenue. And so we would get a uh, approximately $20 payment uh, and an $81 payment uh, for ECO 95, for example. So that combination of of 85% revenue protection and 95% enhanced cover, coverage option. Would result in an indemnity payment of approximately hundred dollars in that scenario uh, where the price went up to five dollars and our yields dropped to 150. Uh, and so let's don't get too caught up in the details of, of these examples but i just wanted to illustrate there's going to be situations where just the eco product is going to trigger payments situations where just the revenue protection is going to trigger payments and situations where they're both going to trigger payments and and so I just wanted to walk through or discuss a little bit uh, the importance of farm and county yields uh, to these to these scenarios when you're thinking about uh, whether you need to to buy the ECO coverage or the enhanced coverage option. Yeah, that's a good point, Michael. And I guess maybe one one thing to think about, you know, you gave an example where a farm yield was down substantially. I think uh, you had the county yield, the historic county yield at 181, our projected county yield at 181. And the farm yield in a particular year dropped um, roughly, uh, well, would that be about a little over 15% down to 150. So the other thing to remember, and so then you looked at it and said, well, you know, you weren't going to trigger a, an ECO payment uh, in that scenario with either the 90% or the 95% coverage because there was no drop in that county. Yield. But the other thing to think about is you could have a significant drop in the county yield and still not trigger a payment. So for example, and again, there's always a lot of specificity here. You held the prices constant to the projected price. But think of a scenario where county yields drop almost 10%, let's say 9%. And, you know, a 9% drop is uh, 180 bushels is, uh, oh, what, I don't know, 16 or so bushels. So that scenario would not trigger an ECO payment, even though the county yield did drop substantially below the you know uh, projected average at, at the beginning of the year, and on the ninety five percent coverage, of course, the difference would be well, you could drop county yields maybe four four and a half percent, something like that, and still not trigger a payment. 
So I think it's important to remember, you could still have some significant drops in yield at the county level that wouldn't necessarily trigger a payment with the ECO product. So um, just keep that in mind. The scenarios are, are interesting and uh, you know there's an infinite number of them. So it's, it's hard to identify upfront which one's gonna happen this year. But remember that, it, that you could, you could even at 90 and 95%, you could still have a drop in those county yield levels and not trigger a payment from the ECO product. You took a look at this for soybeans as well, Michael. What, you want to walk through that real quick? Yeah, I don't think we need to dwell dwell, as, uh, dwell too much on the soybeans because it's very similar to the core analysis. Uh, if you look at the revenue protection product for White County, uh, we've got a, a estimated premium of approximately seventeen dollars uh, for that product. If we look at the eighty-five percent uh, and uh, at revenue protection product, in addition to the ECO ninety-five percent, uh, it increases the premium about sixteen dollars or about double. So it's it's a little a little less than corn, but it still increases that premium quite a bit, approximately double. It was a little more than double, I think, with corn or uh, or, or about the same. Uh, what do you get for that additional uh, 16, 16, 17 dollars in premium going to ninety five percent? You get an additional county revenue guarantee of sixty one dollars, and so uh, and so you do get that higher uh, county revenue guarantee just like you would with corn. All right, let's take a look at uh, the, the possible indemnity payments. The analysis, payments. again, is, is, is very similar to, to corn. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you have a situation where you have a drop in price and, and the drop in price is less than 15% uh, and yields are, are right at trend for both the farm and the county, you're going to trigger ECO payments. Uh, if you have a situation where the farm yield is lower than the county yield, uh, you're going to trigger revenue protection uh, indemnity payment, but no uh, no, no payments to the SCO or ECO products because county yield was still at the trend. And so uh, just like corn, uh, if we have a scenario where the harvest price is higher and, and yields are lower, again, a 2012 scenario, but just not quite as extreme, you're going to, you're going to trigger both revenue protection, uh, revenue protection indemnity payments, as well as ECO payments. And so again, it really depends on, on that relationship between uh, farm and county yields in terms of uh, which which uh, payments are triggered. So let's just kind of wrap up here, Michael. You know, we've got the revenue protection products, we've got the supplemental coverage option, and we've got the ECO. The vast majority of, of people here in the, in really throughout the Corn Belt, especially the Eastern Corn Belt, are, are choosing a, an RP product. Um, they're pretty probably pretty comfortable with it at this point. Um, Probably the big challenge for people this year is going to be the jump in premiums. And that jump in premiums is triggered by two things. One is the fact that the crop prices used to compute the, the revenue coverage have gone up substantially. And then secondly, there's more volatility. And so there's going to be a bit of sticker shock when you look at those premiums. But remember, you are buying substantially more coverage than you were buying a year ago. Um, the supplemental coverage option, I guess I've heard a little bit about this, Michael, with respect to being some people challenged with respect to making their farm program choice. If you think the SCO option is attractive or something you want to pursue, just remember that from a farm program standpoint, you need to sign up for the PLC program for the 2021 crop year to be eligible for SCO. And I think you pointed out for most people for corn, that's probably going to be the program they're going to choose anyway. For soybeans, we've sort of encouraged people to think about the our county program. Um, but to be honest with you, we don't expect either one of those programs to generate a farm program payment in 2021. So it's it's a little bit of a coin toss on soybeans even with respect to whether or not you're better off choosing PLC or our county. If you think the SCO is something you wanna pursue, there's nothing wrong with choosing PLC for soybeans so that you're eligible for SCO. Having said that, we don't find the SCO product all that enticing, um, largely because it's tied to the county yield levels as opposed to farm level. And so, um, but you know, it's okay. It's, it's a product, it's something to think about. It, just don't get fooled into thinking you're replacing, um, for example, if, you're, if you've been historically buying 85% coverage, don't get trapped into dropping down to 80% and thinking you can essentially get the same coverage by buying the SCO pro product that you've been getting in the past. It's not the same animal. So remember that. Uh, but you know what, anything else on SCO, Michael? 
No, I, I wanted to make sure you covered that example. I mean, particularly particularly if, you, if you're if kind of in the middle of Indiana and you're, and you're thinking about 80% or 85% revenue protection, the 80% revenue protection, as you indicated, in addition to SCO, it is cheaper. Uh, for White County, for example, you could save five, $6 per acre in premium. But like you said, it's not the same animal as an 85% revenue protection. The 85% revenue protection is farm yields exclusively. Uh, when, you do, when you do 80% revenue protection and, and 6% uh, SEO, you're mixing the farm yields and, and the county yields. It's not the same thing. Unless those yields are perfectly correlated, which they probably are not, uh, you you don't do not have the same uh, level of coverage with that with that uh, eighty percent revenue protection and six percent SCO. And then the new kit on the block, which is enhanced coverage option, is uh, potentially interesting. I think Michael, you pointed out it's probably most attractive for farms that are in a situation where they can't really afford any significant downside revenue risk from current levels uh, and projected levels, and so. You know, in that context, it might make some sense. The, the limitation of it, of course, though, is the fact that although the coverage levels are very high, 90 and 95 percent, um, ranging down to that 86, so you're picking up between four and nine percent of additional coverage. The challenge is again, it's tied to county level yields, and so it's a county level revenue product. So again, you're mixing a little bit of apples and oranges, and it's a little hard to figure out where you're at exactly. If you're a farm that's already been buying enterprise units and your yields are very highly correlated with the county over long periods of time, then you probably are buying a product that pretty closely approximates what you might get on the, uh, on the enterprise unit side. So probably makes a little more sense there. If you have, if you're not very highly correlated with county yields, then it's a little unclear what you're buying from a from a risk management standpoint. Do you agree with that, Michael? Yes, I, I agree with that. And then just one other point there, uh, you know, to bring home, we 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 brought that home with our examples, uh, you know, fairly fairly well. Is there is there is a a, a rather large increase in premium uh, with either the 95 90% 95 percent. That's because the payout is much more frequent. Uh, than the, than the, than the payout you'd see with an with an eighty percent or eighty five percent product. Yeah, good point. So uh, so that's great. Some interesting choices. I think we'll probably be doing over time doing some more uh, comprehensive analysis on the ECO product. But it's uh, uh, it's an interesting product, and it's one that's probably going to attract some attention, particularly in a year like this when the revenues are up. But uh, the limiting factor is going to be the dollars that that you have to spend to get it. So. With that, uh, we'll just remind our listeners and our viewers that <clears throat> the uh, crop insurance tools from the University of Illinois Farm Doc uh, website are the ones that we typically rely on. So if you're interested in doing some additional analysis and some additional computations on your own, uh, you can visit the Farm Doc site and we'll have a link on our website as well that would take you over there. Uh, but we typically use the Excel spreadsheet program that the uh, our colleagues at the University of Illinois develop and uh, we find that pretty useful. But uh, you can do that on your own if you want to play with some of the numbers a little more carefully. And so with that, uh, let's see, Michael, I think we have another webinar coming up here on the 10th of March. Um, so I think I might have that. I don't have it on a slide, but uh, we have a crop outlook webinar coming up here on the 10th of March following the USDA's release of the um, WASDE report on March 9th. So Nathan Thompson will be joining us for that. We'll review the information on that webinar. Uh, cover the details and have some updated recommendations with respect to marketing strategies. So with that, on behalf of my colleague, Michael Langemeyer and the Center for Commercial Agriculture, I'm Jim Mintert. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.